partner with Eva Swanson, Gloria Felt, and Emily Bennington, who I'll introduce you to in a moment, to have a very interesting and timely conversation about the state of modern feminism. And when I started Empower Women, I was amazed at the diversity of ideas that women had about feminism. And Gloria and I were talking one day about how important it was, how important feminism was to women today, maybe as important as it's ever been, and yet the dialogue is kind of fractured around it, and it's especially fractured between generations. So we've brought this intergenerational group together to have a dialogue about what modern feminism is really about. And it is a dialogue. We're not going to try to reach agreement. We're not going to use the statement, women are X, women are Y, because we aren't any one thing. We're half the population and we're as diverse as the population. And as soon as we start making, being comfortable with that, then we gain more power. So this dialogue and discussion is here to help each of us and to help you watching it come to a better understanding of what you believe about feminism and about being a woman. Because one of the in power principles is that we gain power when we understand what we believe. So let me introduce our guests here. I'm going to start with the youngest among us because youth isn't as often given a voice that uh, to, to express their wisdom. So I'm going to start with Eva Swanson, who is a senior at William and Mary, College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia, and she's also an English student and a, William, a woman's study student. Welcome, Eva. Hi. Thanks for having me. And next we have Emily Bennington. She is an author of a wonderful book you can buy in the Empower Women's Bookstore called Who Says It's a Man's World? And she offers also online coaching at, called The Awake Exec. And she's here to join us today. Welcome, Emily. Thank you, Dana. And finally, we have Gloria Felt, who is a past president of Planned Parenthood. She's a current president and co-founder of a new women's leadership initiative she'll tell us about called Take the Lead. And she's the author of a wonderful book, also in the Empower Women's Bookstore, called No Excuses, Nine Ways Women Can Think Differently About Power. Did I get it right? No, you know, nobody ever gets it right. It's, it's, it's not so bad. It's just nine ways women can change how we think about power. And thanks, Lena. I'm delighted to be here with you. So let me start out by asking first Eva and then each of us to introduce ourselves by saying, what's your relationship with feminism and are you a feminist? Um, I am a self-identified feminist. It's kind of hard for a women's studies major uh, to get away with that in the women's studies department. Um, but I realized I was a feminist when my friends would pick on me um, whenever I said something that kind of um, maybe not seemed like a doormat, as that, as that quote goes. And I, I have slowly begun to just embrace the title. Interesting. Emily, how about you? Yeah, I also classify myself as a feminist, but I know a lot of women, uh, I'm Gen X, I know a lot of women in my generation who don't. And we were talking about this earlier, Dana. I think the fact that there are women out there who actively disassociate their themselves from feminism is a sign that we do need to reclaim this word because at its core, feminism is about equal rights. And so I can't imagine um, anyone being against that. Awesome. Gloria, are you a feminist? Oh my goodness gracious. Uh, simple answer is yes, I am a feminist. <laughs> I am a feminist for so many reasons. And, 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 and you know, since I'm the, the elder statesman here in this, in this panel today, I can say that I'm a feminist in no small part because as the second wave feminism was getting started, I experienced many injustices myself, up close and personal. I couldn't get a credit card without my husband's signature. I couldn't buy a car without my husband co-signing. I could, you know, so I was feeling some of these injustices very up close and personal. And I think that makes a big difference generationally. It, it, it enables me to, to know, oh yes. And, and I, I totally agree with what Emily said. Feminism is just about equal rights or I actually put it even in a bigger frame. To me, feminism is about social justice for everybody. So, so, so what does that really mean today? And, and I say that because, you know, we have a lot more rights than we did, 
like when you were talking about. And there's still areas where we don't have, quote, equal rights under the law. But when you look at the dialogue about, you know, women's place in society and, and women's place in leadership in particular, why we don't have more than 15% penetration in just about any area of society, if that much. It's not just about things that the law can do. It's also about cultural barriers, many of which we carry within us. What What is feminism in that discussion and debate? Well, I'll wow. jump in if you... Okay. Sorry, go ahead, Emily. Well, ahead. you know, I... <laughs> just to, to put into a little bit of context here, you know, to give just a, a tiny little bit of history of feminism for, for anyone watching who, who may be curious about it, because again, you know, just, just the fact that there is so much uh, ambiguity about the word feminism, I think that there needs to be a little bit of clarifications made. I mean, the first wave of feminism, I was about getting the vote, you know, getting equal rights. The second wave was about equal opportunity, getting women into work. And now we're at this third wave of feminism where it's equal, um, equal opportunity for choice. And so, you know, I don't think that there's anyone on this hangout or, or hopefully not anyone watching who would define feminism as being one thing or another. You, you know, it is about that choice. And um, that's where the debate has really come in because there are some people out there who are saying that, that there is one way or another, and really what we're saying is that there is room for all. Big Ten. Yeah. Gloria, did you want to say something there? Well, I just add to that, that that when you ask people whether they believe in equal rights, if I remember correctly, the, the latest Pew poll that was maybe a year or two ago, found that 97% of Americans said there should be equal rights between the, the two genders. So, so it, a lot of it has to do, I think, with how when you're making social change, there are people who don't want that to happen. And so their way of attacking you is to attack your language. And feminism, per se, has been attacked, has been sullied, has been, you know, that it, it was, it was a, a, it drew the sting. The word feminism simply drew the sting from the media and from those who really didn't want women to have equal rights. And what happens then is that, as you said, Dana, a lot of women actually in, internalize some of that cultural approbation that we're getting. And so then they begin to say, well, I'm not a feminist but I want my equal rights. <laughs> well, I'm not a feminist, but you bet I want equal pay. Well, I'm not a feminist, but oh my goodness, you know, I certainly want Title IX. I certainly want the Violence Against Women Act to pass. I certainly want all these policy measures that are all about what actually they, they are today's iteration of feminism. Eva, what do you hear in the younger generation in terms of, you said some people are kind of like not comfortable using the term. Why do you think that is? Definitely. I, I mean, as you guys are saying, I think it's just a misunderstanding about the word. Uh, my friends will say, I'm not a feminist because I still think a, like a guy should ask a girl on a date. And I'm like, great, you can still be a feminist. Perfect. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think there's this weird like man-hating notion around it. And I don't think I don't see that in the feminist movement at all because if we go by Bell Hook's um, definition of feminism, it's the movement to end sexism and uh, men are victims of standards of masculinity every day so in that sense we're helping men as well as women so let me let me put out a challenge here because I may be the most ambivalent feminist of all of us here <laughs> and 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 I'll and I'll and I'll give you an example of why which is that I have many men in my life who by this definition that we're talking about would be feminist but they don't they, they have a very hard idea with that. They, 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 they don't accept that about themselves. They don't accept that what you just said, Eva, that, that you know, part of what we may be doing is trying to expand the idea of equality for all people. Mm -hmm. you know, they, they don't buy into that. And frankly, when I tell them I have ambivalences, they draw closer to me. So in other yes. words, feminism is actually a barrier between me and the men that I want to associate with and develop partnerships with around the very items that we're talking about. And so I begin to question, well, is feminism so important as a word that it should be getting in the way of these really important things? 
Well, as, as somebody who, who has learned that controversy is a valuable thing, Mm -hmm. and that it raises issues and it enables you to actually present your case to people. What I want to just say is the problem isn't with you, the problem is with them. And, and I, I, it makes me actually sad that you would say you would change yourself because somebody else doesn't like what you think you are. Oh, I don't change myself. <laughs> I, I come up with a broader term. I, I come up with finding yeah. that common ground. And that's that's part of where I think f feminism has been um, misunderstood because in some ways what makes people uncomfortable about, uncomfortable about it is the notion that it is in some way militant or in some way demanding e special rights, not equal rights, just special rights because of your gender. And I think that that is some of the language that we should, um, that is some of the language that we should talk about and address mm -hmm. from this perspective because just because you classify yourself as a feminist doesn't mean that you want anything special because you're a woman. It just means that you want equal opportunity and that should be something that everyone should be able to get behind. Mm -hmm. So, so actually, let me let me bring up another subject, which I know we emailed about, and I think is really important here because I have a marketing background, and so if I look at feminism as a brand, and it may not be a brand, I accept that, but uh, we have a branding problem to what you just said, Emily, because um, I was listening to a quote, um, Caitlin Moran, who wrote a great book called um, How to Be a Woman. Uh, from the UK last year. She quotes in there statistics that say, let's see, let me get it right, 71% of women in the United States and 58% of women in the UK don't classify themselves as a feminist. And her response to that is, well, they don't understand what feminism really is. And my marketing response is, well, if, if your whole population doesn't understand what you are, you know, where's the problem? Because branding isn't about what you say you are, it's about how people experience you. So to your point, Gloria, early about, you know, have we let ourselves get defined by the media and by the controversy into a place that we that isn't where we want to be and maybe we can't get out of. Maybe we need to, you know, modernize the dialogue as you're talking about in the language, um, Emily. Maybe the language isn't serving us anymore. Mm -hmm. I think to change our um, our name, though, would be to deny a history that is so important. Yeah, and to be fair, the 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 language served the purpose for the the time. I mean, to Eva's point, I mean, mili being militant as a feminist was what needed to happen in the second wave. You know, with Gloria talking about not being able to get a credit card or buy a car or you know when jobs were classified in the newspaper by gender I mean if you want that fundamentally to change you have to get militant about it because you can't just march up to somebody in in power and ask them to change it there has to be some groundswell movement to get that to change and and you have to be militant period mm -hmm. now we're in that new phase, uh, that third wave feminism, where it, it's still sort of the, the, the sand is dust, it's, the sand is kicked up, and we'll see where it falls. But the fact that we're having this dialogue about what it is, um, I think is, is, is a good step forward. And I love the national conversation that we're having about feminism right now as well. America's having a love affair with this topic. <laughs> well, and I think for good reason, and, and, and reasons that actually support what I said about the value of controversy because the data that you cited is, if it was ever true, is no longer. After the 2012 elections, women, uh, women voters at least, 55% now say they identify with feminism, that they are feminists. And why did that happen? This why was after the last election, you mean? Yes, because what did they see? They saw they saw men like, like what was his name, Todd Aiken, saying that you couldn't get pregnant because of rape, right? Mm -hmm. They saw the results of, of a society in which feminism is not available to women. And they saw what it would mean, not just for themselves, but I think we also think about our daughters and our granddaughters and our friends and our sisters. And we know that's not the kind of culture we want to live in. We, and so suddenly it may be. In fact, I think that, that was, it was a pretty sharp spike from 2010, uh, maybe almost a 10% spike from 2010. So when you have that controversy going on, and it fosters the debate, and then people have to clarify their values. They have to think about what do they really mean? What do they really believe in? 
And once they do, I say they pretty much come down on the side of feminism. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, so let me challenge that and just say, is that really true with respect to the men who want to help women? Because like you said before, you know, the men that I'm talking about who who aren't comfortable calling themselves feminists but want to help the cause, you know, they, they voted along those lines too. If, if Are we really taking advantage of the opportunity that perhaps the election opened up to invite them into the community? Um, because if we're, even if we all, if every woman in the United States and around the world called themselves a feminist, we'd have a precarious, you know, we'd have a precarious majority at about 51% which isn't enough to drive the kind of you know wholehearted change we want. We need more than that. We need mm -hmm. to invite men in. How do we do that um, without making them the problem? <laughs> well, why did, at least in, in your experience, do you know why the men in your life don't identify as feminists? Like what's alienating them about the word? Um, it, it's actually, I mean, for each person, it's a, if it's a, di it's a different reality, but essentially it all comes down to they think that we're saying we're better than them and they're, you know, there's something wrong with men. I mean, that's the emotional reaction. Yeah. And I think it goes back to the militantism, which I agree with you, Emily. I mean, at the time it was necessary. Today we need to establish a different balance. Yeah, um, and I also think that it's important to note that we will not be able to draw men into this conversation until we figure out what it is that we want to stand on um, as, a, as a collective unit. And I know that that's really difficult to do when you're talking about a subject as broad as women. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think that just, just looking at some of the backlash that Sheryl Sandberg has received from her book, which, if you've read it, has nothing but positive intentions about moving women forward in the workforce. And, and she outlines, you know, success is really establishing what the benchmarks mean for you and leaning into that, going for it. And the fact that, you know, there has been such a, a, a backlash against the book that she has written, to me, says that we're not really at a place as women where we've defined what feminism is again. And until we get to that point, then I, I think the men are just going to look at it and say, I don't want any part of what's going on <laughs> with that, you know, and, and who can blame them? Well, I, I guess I've been very lucky in that I, I'm, I'm married to a man who's, who loves to say he's a feminist. And I have had the benefit of, of being around so many men who do say they identify as being mm -hmm. feminists. The, but to, there are a couple of things. One, one, this is not flippant either, but, but, the, but you might tell your friends, Dana, that uh, men who identify as feminists tend to have more sex. <laughs> and that, you know, that might actually help. Um, I don't know if some of these guys I really want to say that to. <laughs> housework, and pretty soon they're having a lot more sex, and they really like that. But the other, the other thing, at a, at a slightly more serious note, is is often just to say, do you have a daughter? And what are your hopes and aspirations for her? Well, and actually, that's the point. Yeah. These men have daughters. They and want they, to help their daughters. They just don't want to say, I'm I'm a feminist. No, I don't really care. They can call themselves whatever they want to, as long as they're doing the right thing. I mean, that's how I feel about it. I really don't care what people call themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, back to, back to Emily's point, I think you make a really good one, Emily, which is that if 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 we can't if we're still struggling with this conversation and what we stand for, and I'm not just talking about us on this call, I'm talking about like the whole the Sheryl Sandberg conversation, where you know we can't accept that people that women have different points of view without trying to make one of us right and one of us wrong. We get into this duality conversation, and it's not helpful. And we and as and then as a group, we don't necessarily stand for anything that, as you say, the men or anybody else could sort of get on board with. And and I perceive too that there's a lot of other women out there who don't want to align as feminist for some of these same reasons because they have diverse points of view. They don't agree with everybody who defines themselves as a feminist, and they get a feeling like, well, you're either with them or against them. And yeah, that's and that's and that's where I think that there's some reframing that needs to be done in the context of feminism being about choice, 
you know, I mean, I, I think that feminism is very much like freedom of speech in that regard. I may not agree with what you have to say, but I'm going to fight for your right to say it. And feminism is is like that to me. It's you know, I may not agree with your choices personally. I'm all about um, helping women advance within their careers because I have seen firsthand in my own family what happens when a woman is is not self sufficient. And so, you know, that's my choice, that's my cause, um, but somebody may not agree with that, and that's fine. And I think that that's sort of the conversation that we need to have is whatever your choice is, that's fine, but let's move forward together. Mm -hmm. Can I just add to that, though, that you're, you're, it is true that whatever your choice is, you have every right to it, and it is fine, but it is also important, I think, for, for women to understand that the choices we make are not just about ourselves. The choices that uh, the choices that we make really do impact other people as well. And if that woman who isn't self sufficient, self sufficient, who chooses not to be at at whatever point in her life, um, ends up having to support, say, two or three children, that impacts other people too. Yeah. It also impacts other other women. If, if women aren't staying, if they aren't leaning in to the workplace, it impacts the next woman who's interested in advancing herself. So while I think it is true, and I would certainly not want to take away the choice of any woman, I also think it's true that we need to have a really strong, tough love conversation with every woman as she's coming up in the world. Because you need to know the consequences of your choice, and that every choice Absolutely. is also... It, you know, it's freedom, but it's also responsibility, and it's also absolutely. It's also and you know, and you know what, Gloria, I think that that's a really brave thing to say because um, I mean, I, I'm I'm behind you, and and I absolutely um, believe in, in what you're saying because I've experienced it in my own life. Um, how important it is for women to be self-sufficient. But I do think that if you if you come down on one side too hard, you better be prepared to face the tomatoes um, in this discussion. And so, you know, I, I, I think that uh, that there's nothing wrong with that, you know, as long as you're prepared prepared for that debate. But um, the fact that that regardless of what side you're on, you have to be uh, you have to have that backbone because it's coming. To me, just it goes back to the ambiguity of this discussion. Eva, what do you think about the the whole issue of choice being the common theme? Yeah, well, I, I think that it's important to note that not everybody has the same opportunities that another person might have. For example, um, we're all white, or all passes white, and um, so we carry privilege in that way. Um, whereas maybe somebody who um, is black or another person of color wouldn't have the same opportunity as another woman. And that's where the feminist movement has gotten in trouble in the past, is not including other types of women, like lesbians or women of color or lower class women. Um, so I think that choice is such a beautiful thing, but not everybody has the same access to choice as other women. Well, yeah. Well, my, uh, I mean, it, my, my mother was white and uh, clearly, and, um, you know, she, she had a, a very difficult life um, as a result of not being financially independent. And um, so I think that there are some economic aspects of this for sure. I mean, that, again, going back to the backlash against Sheryl Sandberg, part of, part of the, the discussion has been, well, easy for you to say, you know, mm -hmm. when, when you're so rich and can afford nannies and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, yeah, I mean, there is, there is room to include everyone in this, in this discussion. Definitely. Eva, I'm glad you brought up the, the fact that we are all white here. And <laughs> that was the first thing that I noticed when I saw all of our faces on the screen. <laughs> Okay, all right. I know part of this discussion we need to have because it's it's extremely important and mm -hmm. um, and and choice absolutely does mean very different things to women who come from different parts of the culture. Mm -hmm. and, and and I and I you know I take some accountability for that. Um, I reached out to the people that we've been having this conversation with, and if we have another one, 
let's make a little more overt effort to be more diverse. And and what is interesting to me is we're talking about a kind of diversity here, in this case, you know, socioeconomic and ethnic. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, that's kind of the point. We, you know, we, we are half the population. We are as diverse as the whole population. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to have any kind of diversity conversation. And anytime we say, oh, well, you know, Sheryl Sandberg should represent all women. Well, <laughs> that's, mm -hmm. that's kind of exactly. crazy to me. Marissa yeah. Mayer, you know, she should, rec she, she should represent every working mother. And I think that's kind of crazy. I don't think any one person should have to represent absolutely everybody else, you know, who has the same thing between their legs. It just doesn't make any sense to me mm -hmm. that way. Can we turn this on our, on its head and ask what what's the conversation men would be having if they were questioning their masculinity in some way? Or, or are they what would be the what would be a term that men might might use instead of okay. feminism? Uh, yeah, if what if if they were analyzing themselves? There would, are men's rights groups. Would they worry about any of this? Would they worry about what people thought about them? Yeah, I think kind of a slightly scary thing is in retaliation of the feminist movement and women reclaiming power is men's rights groups have come about, I don't know if they have a name for their group, but they feel, um, I guess in some way threatened um, and wanna, wanna keep things the way that they are. But I think you're right, I don't think that a man has to speak to every man in the same way that women are held responsible for that. I, yeah, and, and to that point, um, you know, I, I do a lot of work in thought leadership and watching thought leadership. And it's interesting to me, Gloria, what you were saying about sparking controversy that brings out these issues and allows, you know, people to have strong points of view that then can be debated. It is interesting to see how that happens in, quote, the broader uh, population versus among women. The, the framework of the conversation is very different. And to your point, you know, that um, it, it, it's, it's harder for us to talk about these issues be on the basis of the issues as opposed to you know who's saying it we get those things tangled up a lot it makes it harder for us to talk about the issues I think hmm that's a really good point Dana I think one of the one of the cultural constraints that women struggle with even today I'd be curious to know what younger women what the younger women all of you think about this if I'm right or wrong but it, I, I think that one of the cultural constraints that women still struggle with is we are taught to be nice. We are taught to care first about other people. We are taught to, and, and, it, and actually it's a positive in the sense that we understand relationships, we're empathetic, we care about the, the, the quality of relationships. But this terminal niceness <laughs> really often keeps us from getting to the issues we need to get to and it, it makes us I think very often feel like it well it's like Emily said you're gonna get the the rotten tomatoes well okay so like fine <laughs> I have rotten tomatoes thrown at me and you know what I'm alive and well I'm doing just fine here <laughs> God didn't strike me dead or anything <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with you, Gloria. I mean, particularly as somebody who works with women in the workforce, that is a perpetually tricky issue is the debate over what is too nice. I mean, where is that line between being a good team player, which you, you know, to be a leader, nobody wants the stick. You, real leaders lead with the carrot, you know, they, they show by their own example is good leadership and say, yeah, follow that versus, you know, beating people over the head to get what they want done. And so, you know, that is a tricky situation for, for women at work. And, um, and, you know, I think that um, we're getting, again, it goes back to mixed messages because there are books nice girls finish last well you can't be mean because then you're not gonna get what you want I mean so again it just comes back to this ambiguity around this topic and so it's no wonder there are women who are confused about how to behave well and and, and I would just add to that that I, I I love the language that you're using Gloria tough love you know lean in stand up and take the rotten tomatoes because that's the language we, we don't tell ourselves, and those are the stories we don't tell each other. 
that you can survive the rotten tomatoes. You know, to, to Emily's point, you're kind of in this ambiguous place where you don't, you know you're supposed to be nice, but you're, you don't know what happens if you get the tomatoes. Do you come out on the other side? And I think when we start star sharing those stories more and we see what that looks like, what does it look like when a woman can, can take that kind of, uh, you know, uh, rotten tomato and survive like you have, like Cheryl is doing, I think we begin to create an opportunity for a different kind of a role model than the just make, you know, be nice. And so I think in a way, even though it's kind of painful to see what Cheryl Sandberg is going through, I'm really proud of her for doing that. I'm proud of you for what you've been doing and are doing for the exact same reason, because we need to see what that looks like. Mm -hmm. We can aspire to it. I kind of think that maybe a feminist is less likely to care about being nice, and maybe that's where our branding problem is, is we are the people who don't, um, who are more aware that that's what we're taught in society and maybe more able to overcome it and then we're seen as like militant bitches and and perhaps we yeah. are and uh, perhaps that's what society needs yeah but but that's the thing though I mean just the if you're if you're in this discussion and you're worried about being too nice then it can't be well then I've got to be too bitchy like there's got to be some sort of like middle way there has to be some sort of third way and one of the things that struck me about Anne Marie Slaughter's um, article the one that every from the Atlantic that everyone sort of went nuts about last year was that when she had women who were under 30 coming to her about you know what success looks like they were saying I don't see anyone who has is a senior level woman who has a career that I would want to emulate and so when we want to talk about feminism and particularly what it means to be successful in the workforce I think it's our job to model what success can look like in that you know dreaded word balance but you know and, and again just to go back to Cheryl I love that she leaves at 530 every day you know, I love that she is able to, to manage the career that she has with the home life that she has. And I think that's a good example, but we need more of them. I, I think just, you know, in, a, in the largest sense, you grow your courage muscles like you grow any other kind of muscles by using them. Mm -hmm. And the more you kind of get yourself into places where you, you, you have to figure out how to navigate, you have... How do you keep yourself moving forward while you're inching other people forward with you? How do you bring other people along? Um, how do you engage the issues that need to be engaged while at the same time not completely burning every bridge you ever walked across? Uh, those are skills that you only learn by doing them. And it is certainly true that studies have shown that women are judged more harshly in the workplace when they do come on strong. Whereas, you know, men can exhibit the exact same behavior as women and they will not be judged nearly as harshly. So one of the things that I talk to women about when I'm speaking or, or, or doing my uh, Power Tools workshops is that you, 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 we, any group that is not the privileged group has to be, in effect, bilingual. You have to know how to speak the language of the predominant group the group that's in power. And at the same time, you have to be able to be authentically yourself and speak your own language as well. And you have to be able to navigate between the two and interpret between the two. It's not an easy trick. But I just call that being gender bilingual. And, and I think it's one of the things that women need to learn as we're navigating where we are right now, especially in the workplace. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Um, I appreciate that analogy a lot. Um, because I think that my version of it is that we're puzzle solvers. In other words, the stories tell us, you're right, the research says that men and women don't perceive women as natural leaders because our, our stereotype of leader is male. Okay, fine. But that's a story we don't have to believe. If we so try to solve the puzzle of what does our authentic leadership style really look like, to Emily's point, you know, how do we use the carrot? How do we become an authentic leader? And we solve that puzzle. We solve it for ourselves, and then we model it for everybody else. But if we just believe the story, we don't even try to solve the puzzle because we don't believe there's a solution. And that's just not a place to start, I don't think. Mm -hmm. 
And you have to see it to be it, you know, I mean, that classic uh, feminist mantra, but and there needs to be more examples of women who are excelling in the workplace. I mean, the fact that Marissa Meyer, just to use her as an example, is sort of everyone, she's under this microscope because people feel like she, rep she represents every, you know, woman CEO and is she looking out for us and every single decision that she makes is so scrutinized. I mean, that the more women that we have in power, the less the ones who are there are going to be under that microscope, and I think that will be better for all of us as well. That's exactly right, and, and that's what all the research shows, is that as soon as there's the 30 percent or more uh, population of anybody, of that minority, then the minority is no longer the token. Now they're just part of uh, the group, and they can be more authentic, and they can be viewed as more as individuals as opposed to representatives of that group. So we have a long way to go at the CEO level, and at the senior leadership level. Which leads me to my last wrap-up question here, which is, you know, one of the things that Sheryl Sandberg has been accused of is that of is of saying feminism is stalled. You know, our revolution is stalled. And we need to get it going again. And my question to you is, are we stalled? Is is the is the revolution stalled in your in your view? And what is it we need to do to move it the next step, whether that's to get it out of a stall or just to move it forward? Why don't I start with Eva again? Um, I don't see it as stalled just because I'm so involved with the movement every day through academia. Um, so I think there's so many women in my generation that are feeling so passionately about this through studying it in school. Um, and I also think that there will never, I mean, I wish there would, I wish it would stop, but there will never be instances, um, or never not be instances that make us stop and kind of assess where our culture is in sexism, for example, the Steubenville case that's going on right now. Um, I mean, I'm feeling very, very passionate in my feminism right now um, with like internet activism and signing petitions and things like that over the way that the media um, has handled the Steubenville rape cases. Um, so I would not say that feminism is stalled, um, but that's just kind of a personal reflection. That counts. <laughs> <laughs> Gloria, uh, Emily. Uh, well, I I think it. I think Cheryl's right. I I think it has stalled to some degree, and I think that she has a great example in her book about, um, particularly for the workforce, where she talks about a man and a woman at the starting line of a marathon, and mm -hmm. the gun goes off, and they both start running, and that's pretty representative of what's going on, right? Women and men are entering the workforce um, at pretty much equal levels, and then the men are obviously advancing far beyond the women. And part of what she says is that the messages that men get are go, 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 you're doing great, keep going, but the messages that women get are your kids need you, or you're starting strong, but you're not going to finish, and so women get all these mixed messages, and so they're dropping out slow but sure, and I think um, Forbes called that the, the biggest, that women in the workforce are the biggest disappearing act on earth, <laughs> and, and so when you stop to consider that, and when you stop to, you know, sort of deep dive into the reasons why, as we've been doing on this discussion, um, I think it's very clear that, that the, the feminist movement, with regard to the workforce, has stalled um, because the the numbers don't lie. I, I would agree with, with what both what both of you have said, and and I I mean I I'm very heartened by the passion that I see among so many young women today, and I realize that I'm very fortunate that I happen to interact more with with young women who are interested in feminism and who who want to carry whatever the next wave may be forward. So I'm I'm very blessed in that way, but we have to look at the numbers. We have to be realistic about the numbers. And the fact is that, as Emily said, in the workplace, women are stalled. We've been at less than 20%, as you know, of the top leadership positions now for a couple of decades. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so I think in order to break through that, we have to realize that, that every movement, this happens to every movement, it, it wins just enough that some people get co-opted, some people peel off, a lot of people get apathetic because they think everything has been done and they don't need to stay involved. And I actually I think apathy is our bigger problem than people who don't like feminism. I think the biggest problem mm -hmm. is people simply saying, well, we've opened every door, so what's the problem? What's the issue? 
So uh, is that, ha have we come a long way? Yes, we have. Do we have a long way yet to go? Yes, indeed we do. And I'm awfully glad that there are all these generations of women who, whatever language we may use, uh, it looks to me like we're all working together to get to full parity. I certainly hope so. And um, I also hope that we can have more of these dialogues with other more diverse groups of people, and not more diverse, but <laughs> equally diverse groups of people. Um, because I think we're, the issues we're raising here are not simple, they're not easy, they're not easy to put labels on, and Gloria, your comment about the, the place in time that the movement may be in is really important for us to, to be giving some thought to, because uh, Emily, you're right, the numbers don't lie, and if we're not careful, we're not going to be able to take care of bringing in the passion that people like Eva are expressing and letting that really move us forward. So I want to thank you all for being part of this discussion today and being here on Empower Women. And um, I will invite everybody to uh, talk about things in comments below, uh, things that resonated with you, things that you still have questions about. Um, let's have a dialogue in the comments below, and maybe we'll pull those into our next, uh, our next broadcast where we take this on in a, in a new way. Thanks so much, all of you. Thanks, Jamie.